pleased to present to you uh, Peter Hudis. Uh, Peter Hudis uh, works at the Oakland Community College, Oakton uh, Community College, and uh, uh, he uh, is primarily concerned with uh, Marxist uh, social theory and uh, Hegelian philosophy. Uh, he's also a member of the International uh, Marxist Humanist Organization and an editor uh, of the uh, complete works of uh, Rosa Luxemburg that will be published by Verso. Uh, and uh, he's also an author of a, a great, uh, very lucid and insightful book, uh, Marx's Concept of the uh, Alternative uh, to Capitalism, uh, where he basically tries to uh, refute this uh, myth which says that Marx was exclusively a critical theoretician of capitalism but didn't have anything to say about uh, socialist or communist, if you prefer, uh, society. Uh, well, uh, through his careful reading of uh, Marx's work, he shows that uh, some conception of uh, alternative, uh, an alternative to capitalism nevertheless uh, either implicitly or explicitly exists uh, in the works of early as well as in the works of the later Marx uh, and moreover he shows that uh, this concept is uh, much uh, broader, much more complex than, uh, than these uh, regular notions of socialism just as uh, nationalization of the means of production or abolition of uh, private property or the market. Uh, he shows that if we want to think of an alternative to capitalism, we have to take into consideration the abolition of the capitalist law of value, uh, the abolition of uh, class domination and uh, alienation. And this uh, will also be uh, a theme uh, of his today's uh, talk. So, uh, Peter, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sasha, and for the uh, everybody who organized this meeting. Um, <clears throat> this is my first time in Ljubljana, and I hope it's not my last, actually. Um, it seems to me that uh, today's radical movement is in the grip of a major contradiction uh, all over the world. On the one hand, the non-viability of capitalism and its drive for permanent ongoing austerity is more evident each passing day, which is leading increasing numbers of people to question uh, whether uh, human life including the life of the planet as a whole, is even possible in the long run uh, with capitalism. Um, and yet at the same time, many thinkers and activists are very reluctant to spell out explicitly uh, an, a viable alternative uh, to a capitalist society that we can strive for, even when uh, they call themselves socialists or communists or anarchists, and even when they're actively trying to fight one or another aspect of the system. Um, so we have this sort of contradiction where we're striving for an alternative, but the articulation of what that alternative exactly is, is very often left, at the very least, vague and unclear. Now, of course, this is not true of everybody. We still have certain people out there, uh, as we all know, who think they know what socialism and communism is. Uh, they think it's uh, what it basically was, perhaps uh, slightly reformed, that they think it's basically the abolition, that Sasha mentioned, abolition of private property, control of the economy by uh, some kind of democratically, pseudo-democratically organized state, uh, through market planning, etc. But frankly, the number of orthodox Marxists who still hold to the traditional view of uh, socialism as uh, some version of uh, actually existing socialism uh, that existed uh, in much of the world uh, before uh, 91, 1991, is not uh, very compelling. Not many people hold it. Um, there's much more important is a number of people who are striving for something radically different, but still seem reluctant to articulate what that different thing is. So that's what I want to address today. This is how to get through this contradiction. Now first, um, nobody has a problem thinking about a socialist or communist society, obviously. If we had any problem thinking of the need for one, we wouldn't be here. Yes, we can all think about a new society. That's not difficult. But can we know, is it possible to know the content? of such a society in advance before it is created. Um, <clears throat> now, um, it's a difficult thing to know the content of what we're striving for in advance. And uh, one problem is because of the very nature of capitalism itself. That is, capitalism, as uh, we all know, tends to disturb and sweep away all fixed, fast, frozen social relations. 
Um, and capitalism tends to, uh, for this reason, appear immutable because it reifies human relations even as, as it transforms them radically. Uh, and it does so because capitalism subsumes human activity under abstract forms of domination. This is somewhat I want to talk about today, focusing on these abstract forms of domination. We're all aware of the more concrete forms, uh, police abuse, uh, war, imperialist intervention, etc. But there are abstractions, value, exchange value, socially necessary labor time, and of course money, that those thoroughly, thoroughly dominate human subjectivity that they tend to appear natural and even necessary. And this is so, so prevalent that even critics of capitalism who want to think outside the horizon of capitalism very often invoke notions of value, exchange value, money, uh, in thinking or describing about a post-capitalist society, which I think is a major problem. Of course, there is another problem why it's very hard to envision an alternative to capitalism, aside from the nature of capitalism itself, and that is also, of course, the rather unfortunate legacy of Western social democracy and Stalinism, which has only reinforced the impression among masses of people uh, that capitalism has no alternative, because the various alternatives that arose against it have all fallen into line uh, with the logic of capital. Um, so, it's um, relatively easy to imagine a society without private property in the market, but it's not so easy to imagine a society that dispenses with value, exchange value, social necessary labor time. This takes a much greater leap of imagination. But my argument today is this is the leap of imagination we need to take. Now, if you'll permit me, uh, I just want to say a few more words about this difference between thinking about a new society and knowing the content of a new society. Um, because the distinction between these two things, thinking it and knowing it, brings to mind a major problem in the thought of somebody I usually don't like to talk about in uh, meetings on radical activism and theory, but I will anyway for now, just to put a point across, Immanuel Kant, um, whose critique of pure reason famously argued that we cannot know things in and of themselves. We cannot know the thing in itself. We can only know, he says, how things appear to us. And this includes, he argued, the object of freedom. Uh, according to Kant, the limits of human understanding is such that our minds prevent us from knowing what freedom actually is, just as it prevents us from knowing things in themselves in general. At the same time, however, Kant held that while we cannot know things in themselves, we can think about their existence. Uh, as he put it famously, an object cannot appear to us unless there is something to appear in the first place. Therefore, we argue, he argues, we can think that there is something called the thing in itself out there which we cannot know. But we can still think it's there, but we don't know what it is. Now, why do I mention that? It seems to me that many people who contend that we are not now in the position to discuss the specific content of a post-capitalist society treat the idea of socialism as an unknowable thing in itself. Um, that doesn't stop them from arguing in favor of socialism, because they can still think about socialism in some vague, indeterminate form, but that uh, does not mean that they are able to specify anything of its content. Now, that's a problem. Why is it a problem? Again, Kant showed us why it's a problem. Kant said, if we can think the existence of something, but we can't know its content, that what avenue is open to us? Simply a moral approach to the pursuit of the thing in itself by acting as if we can know it, even though we can't. Now, um, this is not as far as it, distant as it may sound from the claim many people make today that we shouldn't indulge in the effort to envision what a post-capitalist society looks like on the grounds that this is uh, engaged in, entails doing something that all good Marxists are never supposed to do, you get spanked by your mama if you do this, uh, and that is uh, make blueprints for the future, uh, supposedly. We're not supposed to engage in this kind of exercise. But what logically flows from that position, that we can think about the new society but we can't spell out its content, is the same uh, result that you get in Kant. We therefore treat socialism as a purely moral imperative that has no necessary uh, necessity to emerge, and that uh, is really more an article of faith than something that is demonstrated and argued for systematically. 
My own view is I have no problem with faith. I just think it's not enough. Uh, and I think that we uh, should be able to go beyond this distinction of thinking something without knowing it. So, um, Marx, by argument, is himself actually did not uh, fall into this contradiction of presuming that we can think about socialism, but we can't know anything about it, not least because he was a Hegelian, and Hegel, as you all know, I'm sure, rejected Kant's distinction of uh, thinking the thing in itself and yet not knowing it. And Hegel says we can know the thing in itself because we can think it. So he breaks through that contradiction. And Marx builds upon this foundation of Hegel, but of course taking things in a different direction that Hegel never went by looking at capitalism in order to do what? Now we all know that Marx spent an awful lot of time critiquing capitalism. One could say that from 1844 uh, through the end of his life, there was one and only one question that Marx was interested in, uh, and that is, what is capital? And it's not an easy question to answer. People come sometimes, students especially, answer, could you write down on the board, what is capital? Give me a definition. You know? I really am bad at this. I cannot sum it up in one sentence. You can't just say it's a product of labor. You can't say it's even uh, congealed labor. But if that was the case, capital would have existed for all of human history. It's a very mystifying concept. But why did Marx critique capital? Why would he critique it if he not, did, not, did not have some sense to begin with of what the world would look like in the absence of capital as the dominant form of social mediation? So my argument is, is that while Marx was um, certainly not interested in writing blueprints or recipes for the future, he does discuss and have, he has a vision of a post-capitalist society, even an implicit one, and that vision actually informed his critique of capital. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't that first you have the critique of capital, then you get a sense of what happens after the abolition of capitalism. Is that your vision of what might be capitalism informs the depth of your critique of capitalism. Hmm? Um, Karol Kosek, the Czech Marxist humanist philosopher, had a beautiful expression. He says, humanity forms its present on the basis of its conception of the future. We all do this, whether we're left or right. We all form our everyday existence based on our understanding of what the future will be, whether we know it or not. Marx could not have formed his critique of capital without a conception of what the future could be in the absence of capital as the major form of social, social uh, relation. So as I try to show in Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism, Marx did have, I think, a bit more to say about a post-capitalist society uh, than many people give him credit for. Now, I want to make it very clear, however, I'm not going to argue, because I don't believe it, that Marx has the answer to this extraordinarily difficult question of what is a viable concept of socialism that avoids the pitfalls of both what called itself socialism in the 20th century in the West, social democracy, or status communism, and at the same time uh, addresses the fundamental uh, uh, problems and the need to transform and improve. Uh, free market capitalism. I'm not suggesting there's a model in Marx or even a specific outline. Rather, there are certain conceptual markers. But I do think that without these markers as our foundation for initiating a discussion, whatever discussion about a post capital society we have will be tremendously weakened. So I think when I was trying to figure out, because I've been concerned about this issue for about 15 years now, uh, how to combat Tina, the notion that there is no alternative, uh, I more and more began to uh, realize that perhaps we have to go back to the source and see if Marx had anything to teach us on this. Now, this is, of course, a, a big discussion, and I don't want to talk too much, not least because I don't like to hear my voice uh, too much, but I want to give a lot of time for discussion, but it's a, you can't do it all in one talk, even if you uh, have wanted to. So I'm just going to focus on one issue, one, one, one of the many concepts that we can draw from Marx on this. It's not the only one. My book discusses a, a number of them. There's others not in my book that are certainly needed to be discussed. And that is the need to break from the domination of abstract universal labor time. So that four-letter word, time, is going to be really my entire presentation. Now, um, why time? Um, 
Well, we all know where capital comes from, right? There can be no capital without labor. But what is labor? Um, as philosophers, uh, we always ask simple questions. Hopefully, don't give too complex an answer. <laughs> But um, according to Marx, labor, as he puts it, is a special productive activity exercised with a definite aim. He's not talking about alienated labor, just any kind of labor. Labor, then, generically speaking, has the definite aim of transforming what we find in the past or the present uh, into that which can shape the future. That is, in laboring, the three-dimensionality of time becomes integral to our humanity. I don't know if animals really have a concept of time in the sense that we do. Uh, I think some of them are quite intelligent. Maybe sometimes I think they're more intelligent than some people I know. Uh, but in laboring, we achieve a sense of past, present, future as a continuum, and we make use of this sense of time to control and to, um, to organize our existence. Um, this is how we come to know ourselves as a totality. In capitalism, however, it goes without saying, time takes on a very different meaning. In capitalism, we do not, orga we do not organize or control time. That is, it's not uh, that which allows us to shape our existence in accordance with a definite end. Time instead organizes or controls us. Everything is inverted. It's upside down. This is, I think, at the core of Marx's critique of capital, this inversion when it comes to time. <coughs> Because the central problem of capitalism, as I see it, according to Marx, is not the existence of private property in the market, and I'm not in favor of either one, by the way, just to be clear. They are a problem, but they're not the central problem. Um, because surely private property preceded capitalism. Capitalism didn't invent private property. And just as surely, capitalism does a great deal to destroy private property. And frankly, I don't think there's any social system that's ever existed that does more to destroy private property than capitalism. Uh, just look at the number of small farmers that have been eliminated, small businessmen gobbled up by mega corporations. Capitalism, you know, concentrates property in smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer hands in larger units of concentration. Uh, history also shows that, history, that capitalism can exist with a variety of property forms, including state-applied ones. Uh, we'd say the same thing with the market, of course. The market is very integral to capitalism, but you can certainly have, I think, um, <clears throat> A, but I think Marx's critique of capital goes much further than the existence of the market. I think what Marx wants to do is to address what makes a generalized market possible. And that has to do with the reduction of the diverse array of concrete labors to one homogeneous mass, and the term is abstract labor. Let me just go into this a little bit then. Uh, some of you uh, have a sense of this, but just to sum it up a little bit. Um, it's often said, uh, well, labor is a source of all value. You know, it's what I've taken as an article of faith, or at least a statement, uh, much of the left movement. But this is, strictly speaking, an incorrect statement. Labor is not the source of all value. Not any type of labor, according to Marx, but only a very specific type of labor creates value. The kind of labor that creates value is abstract, homogeneous, undifferentiated labor. Concrete labor, specific labor engaged in doing specific things, generic sense of labor, produces use values, but it doesn't produce exchange value. Abstract labor produces exchange value. Abstract labor is the phenomenal form of value. Um, and this is the reason why, to make this distinction clearer, Ryder Dunievsky, a US Marxist humanist philosopher, had put it this way. She said, it's really strictly speaking more correct to say that, labor, that Marx had a value theory of labor rather than a labor theory of value. She used this term in 1958 in her book Marxism and Freedom, a value theory of labor. She's looking at why labor takes on the form of value to begin with. So in much of the radical movement, what's the, the discussion about the problem of capitalism? It's about, well, the workers produce all this value and they get so little of it back. So there's a problem of distribution. So we should have more equitable distribution. I'm not against more equitable distribution. As a matter of fact, I fight for it in my union and other kinds of work that I do. But that's not the fundamental problem of capitalism, is the unequal distribution of value. It's the fact that capitalism is governed by value production to begin with. There's nothing natural about labor taking the form of value. That is an abstract monetary equivalent. 
That's very perverse, because most human societies never had this before capitalism. So, what do we mean, what do I mean when I say that abstract labor um, is the source and substance of value? Well, it means that the value of a commodity is actually not determined by the actual amount of time employed in creating it. There's another vulgarization of Marx that we always run into, that the value of a commodity is determined by the amount of labor time it takes to produce the commodity, so it take, took more labor time to produce this book than it did to produce this paper clip, so therefore the book is cost more than the paper clip. Bingo, end of discussion. Uh, please, uh, don't, uh, you know, this is, think about this for five minutes, you realize how ridiculous this must be. Because if the actual amount of time that it takes to produce a commodity determines its value, then the capitalist would tell you, hey, slow down, work slow. Because the slower you work, the more labor time embodied in the, in the product, and I can get more value for it by selling it. Now, has anybody had a job where a capitalist walks into and tell, your boss tells you, please slow down, I don't want you to work so fast. I want you to take your time and enjoy yourself. If you have that happen, please let me know at the end of the meeting, and I'd like to try to apply for the position. Uh, I don't think it's very likely that this is what happens. So why doesn't it happen? It's because the value of a commodity is actually not determined by the actual amount of time that you employ in producing it. It's determined by um, the average amount of time that is necessary to produce it, given the laws of the world economy and the world market. For example, if you have a worker uh, here in Slovenia that assembles a car in 24 hours, Let's say an automobile. I don't know how much car production or whatever such production you have, but just any commodity can do it. You work in producing a, some kind of vehicle in 24 hours, bicycles, whatever. Um, if the same vehicle can be produced in China in 18 hours, then the extra six hours it takes to produce that vehicle in Slovenia does not create any value. From a capitalist point of view, that's wasted labor time. That's why the, then your boss comes in and says, hey, you're making it in 24 hours. In China, the same object is being made in 18 hours. You must work faster, you must speed up, you must have more labor-saving devices to produce more and less units of time. But of course, if it stops there, that wouldn't be so bad, but it's not as much worse than this. Then you produce it in 18 hours, and then your boss comes in three months later and says, oh, by the way, well, he doesn't know that. He doesn't actually know what the labor time average is. But the, boss comes in and says, you must work faster because the average necessary time to produce that commodity has probably dropped further in the next three months. It's not 18 hours, it's now 16. And there's constant pressure to produce more and you receive less for it in the long run. So in other words, what determines value is not the time taken to produce a thing, but the minimum time it could possibly be produced in. This uh, is established, this behind the backs of the producers, workers don't know what that social average is, and capitalists don't know what that social average is. The capitalists are not in control of the system, they just play things. Capital is in control of the system. I just want to reiterate that. Marx never wrote a book called Capitalists. Why am I against them? He wrote a book called Capital. I could have subtitled it, Why am I against it? <laughs> because the whole point to capitalism is that human relations take on the form of relations between things people become personifications of economic categories. So, um, <clears throat> that's the problem with the system. So this minimum social average necessary labor time is established behind our backs and is revealed to us through the laws of competition. Uh, Dunievsky had a nice formulation for this, by the way, which I'll just quote you because many of you may not have not read the book, Marxism and Freedom. Uh, she put it this way, she said, socially necessary labor time is the handmaid of the machine which accomplishes the fantastic transformation of all concrete labors into one abstract mass. Now, this is um, what I think is the real engine of uh, capitalism and its exploitative nature, not only towards the laborer, but towards all people, and indeed towards nature especially. Because as competition reveals the minimum amount of labor time necessary on average to produce a commodity in the world market, we're forced to produce within that time unit irrespective of our sensuous desires or needs or our capacities. We become alienated not just from the product of our activity, a distribution problem, we become alienated from the activity of producing the product. And this alienation spreads into all facets of everyday life. Uh, time becomes uh, a mere carcass, in other words. We are not controlling time. Time is controlling us. It's a Kafkaesque world. 
So capitalism takes uh, the defining characteristic of our species, our ability to consciously organize time to meet our needs, and makes us prisoners of the very thing that could make us uh, uh, free creators. Um, and um, here is why it's important to say this. Because once we identify the central problem of capitalism as located here, it becomes much easier, I think, to begin to specify what would it take to make an exit from such a society. Um, and I think an exit from such a society would have to entail uh, the elimination of value production. Now, what does it mean to eliminate production for the sake of value? Obviously, in capitalism, uh, things are not produced, whether it's goods or, goods or services. Uh, they're not produced for the sake of um, uh, providing a product or a service. I mean, General Motors does not make cars for the sake of making cars. Colgate Pomalo does not make toothpaste for the sake of making toothpaste. And the University of Phoenix in the US, which gives out degrees if you pay them enough money, uh, does not uh, produce degrees for the sake of giving people an education. All three of them produce for one purpose, to make money. If they didn't make money, they wouldn't produ be producing what they're producing anymore, yes? So in capitalism, the whole system is driven to increase the amount of value as an end in itself. And that that's why they can never have enough money, the capitalists, because the drive of the system is produced for the sake of production, produced to augment the value itself. Now, if that's the central problem, then you can't get away from capitalism without ending that production as an, uh, for the sake of value. And what that means, you have to get rid of the substance of value. What's the substance of value? Abstract labor. Where does abstract labor come from? Allowing concrete labor to be dominated by an abstraction. And how do you get away from that? Well, you get away from the dominance of abstract, socially necessary labor time is what controls your conscious purposeful activity. So, uh, in other words, in a socialist or a communist society, actual labor time would, have, would no longer be dominated by socially necessary labor time. The exertion of concrete acts of producing use values would serve as the one and only measure of our existence. No longer would a force operate behind our backs that uh, considers our activity useless or unproductive if it fails to meet an abstract standard. In other words, a dicta this dictatorship of time that we live under today. You know, I find it so curious that we even put the, well, most of young people don't do this anymore, you have your cell phones. But it's very curious that you even wrap this around your wrist. You're being prisoned by this tick, 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 tick. Yes? Huh? Okay? Um, this time is an abstraction rather than a human variable uh, becomes a kind of dictatorship upon us. Only when that is shattered, when only until we reach the point where time becomes the space for human development, which is one of my favorite phrases from Marx, I think, could you really say we've exited capitalism? Now, I know this sounds a little abstract. So to flesh it out a bit more, uh, permit me to give a quote from Marx. And uh, this is probably a quote many of you may not have encountered. Uh, I didn't I think I even notice it until I was writing this book. I mean, I had read the Grindrism many times, but when you approach an old book, old book with a new problem, sometimes you see things you didn't see before. <laughs> it's nice things about asking questions. Uh, this is what Marx writes in the Grindrism. He's talking about the nature of capitalism, and suddenly, out of the blue, he does something that the Marxists say he's not supposed to do. You see, you get punished if you do this. And that is, he starts discussing a post-capitalist society. And he says the following, quote, In a post-capitalist society, the general character of labor would not be given to it only by exchange. Its communal character would determine participation in the products. The communal character of production would, from the outset, make the product into a communal general one. The exchange initially occurring in production, which would not be an exchange of values, but of activities determined by communal needs and communal purposes, would include from the beginning the individual's participation in the communal world of products. That is, labor would be posited as general prior, prior to exchange. That is, the exchange of products would in no way be the medium mediating the participation of the individual in general production. I want you to spell out what I think he's saying in this dense quote. This is me now speaking. I think what Marx is suggesting is that in the post-capitalist society, labor would still be a factor in social reproduction. I mean, you can't have a society without some degree of labor, uh, whatever we want to call it. 
However, its general character would not be based on the domination of abstract or undifferentiated labor. After all, as I mentioned, abstract labor is a substance of value. It is the common denominator that allows this manifold number of commodities to be universally exchanged for one another. You can't exchange many things for each other under a single, by a single common denominator called money unless there is a universal equivalent embodied in all the different commodities. And that universal equivalent is abstract labor, which takes the phenomenal expression of exchange value. Hence, human relations are indirectly social in a society governed by value production, since we're connected to each other through abstract forms of domination, such as money. Labor is indirectly social in society, in the capitalist society. In contrast, in a post-capitalist society, I think he's suggesting, labor takes on a general character prior to the exchange of products, based on the communal character of production itself. That is, freely associated people distribute the elements of production according to their needs based on a communal deliberation, instead of being generated by social forms that act independently of them, such as the state or the market. Now, I don't think Marx is referring to small, isolated little communities here that operate in a world dominated by value production, but to a communal network of associations in which production for value is superseded on a systemic level. And if that such a situation emerges, labor would become directly social, since the actions and decisions of the human subject, not some autonomous force such as exchange value, would mediate the relations between the individuals. Um, so, uh, the subjective acts of the community of individuals serves as the cement, the mediation, the connecting link of the society itself. No longer will we be governed by abstractions, will we would now be governed by our mutual, mutual uh, respective sensuous needs and um, desires. Now, of course, exchange of some sort would have to exist in a post-capitalist society. We don't only produce what we need for ourselves. I'm not talking about going back to the farm and you know, growing three vegetables and living off of that, uh, though I would like to eat more vegetables and uh, less uh, animal products. I think we all would do better to live by that. But anyway, um, we still need some exchange um, mechanism, but it would have to be radically different than in capitalism. Instead of exchange being based on values, prices, markets, distribution, I think would have to be governed by an exchange of activities, this is Marx speaking again, which is, in the quote that I just gave you, which is determined by communal needs and communal purposes. Uh, exchange value, which again is the phenomenal expression of value based on abstract labor, would be eliminated as soon as new freely associated non-alienated conditions of work would come into existence. So, uh, not to belabor the point, um, what Marx is saying here is a point that he reiterates many times. He reiterates it in Chapter 1 of Capital, Line 2 of Capital, in Theories of Surplus Value, in his Critique of the Gotha Program. There's actually a lot of places where Marx addresses what a post-capitalist society would look like in its basic outline. Um, if you remember Chapter 1 of Capital, which is written on a very highly abstract level, in the most important section, the fetishism of commodities, what does Marx do after he uh, pinpoints the uh, myster mysterious nature of commodity fetishism? Mr. Mr. Materialist, Marx. He says, let us imagine for a change an association of freely associated people. Let us imagine. And then he goes on for a page to say, what would a post-capitalist society look like? In pretty much the same terms that I just elaborated it here. It's remarkable. Right there in chapter one of Capital. Um, and what does he say there? He says that, uh, well, we have directly social labor in a post capitalist society because you get rid of exchange value, you get rid of value production, you're not producing for the sake of value, you're producing for the sake of human needs. Uh, but of course, uh, you have to figure out some way to compensate people for the amount of uh, time they put into or, or producing goods and services for others in society. So he says, what, uh, how would they be so compensated? He says, on the basis of the actual amount of labor time that they engage in. That is, if you work four hours, you receive four hours worth of goods and services from the common storehouse that is produced in that amount of time. Now, he's not saying you are compensated based on the average amount of time it takes to produce that object. You're produced on the actual amount of time. You see, so it's going to vary with different cooperatives. It's going to vary with different situations. 
one hour of labor is going to count the same as any other hour of labor. Not as an abstract average, not as socially necessary labor time, but simply actual physical amount. Now, as I, uh, I know people sometimes find that a little strange. This is uh, in the Great Rizzo, it's in the chapter of Capitals in the Critique of the Gotha program that one hour of labor counts the same as any other hour of labor, but let me just make a personal confession to you. Uh, you know, I'm a mouthful professor, you know, it took me a few years to get there, I admit, right? Especially in the United States, a Marxist doesn't get, become a professor that easily, as uh, you might think. <laughs> um, it's a lot of uh, political pressure on people to conform, and if you don't, you uh, get fired. Um, but in any case, um, I certainly could say that I put in a few years of work to get to where I'm at, but I don't understand why I, my hour of labor should count more than what my father did for a living, which was collecting garbage for 42 years. Why should my hour of labor count more than his hour of labor? I just don't, I have never found a compelling argument for this. Surely my labor takes a certain amount of skill. By the way, so did his. Don't know about that. Uh, let me talk to you about collecting garbage, or working for the sanitation department, uh, or being a machinist, or something like this. What Marx is saying is that at least in a, provisionally, when we exit from capitalism, we have to have a different mode of distribution that reflects the radically different mode of production, whereas wherein we have made the transition from indirect social relations to direct social relations. So we get rid of being governed by time as an abstract average, and instead you get compensated on the actual time you work, not on a social average of what you produce in a given unit of time. These are two very different things. Okay. Now, um, this is further spelled out in the Critique of the Gotha program, and I'm just going to read the passage where he says this. Uh, as I'm sure you're all aware that in that uh, very famous writing, The End of His Life, Marx of puts out this very famous principle, which, by the way, he didn't, he didn't invent. It's been around a long time before Marx. I think you can even find it in the Bible. Uh, from each according to your ability, from each according to your needs. A very beautiful notion of what would prevail in the ultimate life phase of a socialist or communist society. I should also mention, by the way, the distinction of socialism and communism makes no sense in Marx. Marx never distinguished a socialist versus a communist stage of development. Socialism and communism are interchangeable words for the same thing. And by the way, sometimes he uses, he doesn't even use the word socialism or communism. In the Grim Rizzo, he only uses the word socialism as a pejorative, just like in the 1844 manuscripts, he often mentions communism only as a negative or pejorative. But in the Grim Rizzo, he calls the new society the society of free individuality. So much for Marx being a mere collectivist. In any case, um, here is what he says, prevail, now, but he says, that from each according to his ability, to each, to each according to their ability, to each according to their needs, that's not going to happen on the first day, however, after you make a revolution or something. Because we've all been raised within capitalistic class society, we've all absorbed its muck, right? We're all dripping with the muck of the ages still attached to us. The new society emerges from the, from the womb of the old. And you know when you come out of the womb, there's, there's some cleaning involved. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's, you, you, it's not, you know. So, um, he's, he's as, as but utopian as Marx is in many places, he's also extremely realistic that in the initial moments or phase of a socialist or communist society, uh, you're not going to be able to practice from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. You have to have a different distributive principle that prevails. And what is that principle? This is what he says. I'm quoting him again. This is the last quote I'll give. He says, within the collective society based on common ownership of the means of production, the producers do not exchange their products. The producers do not exchange products. So there's no commodity exchange. Just as little does the labor employed on the product here appear as the value of these products, as a material quality possessed by them. Since now, in contrast to capitalism, individual labor no longer exists in an indirect fashion, but directly as a component part of the total labor. So, in other words, um, within the society, based on common ownership of the means of production, uh, there's no value of production, there's no split in the category of labor between concrete and abstract, there's no exchange value, therefore there can be no generalized commodity production 
Instead, it's an exchange of activities based on communal deliberations, which obviously is going to take some kind of central planning authority to coordinate this, but based on democratic control of the workplace and enterprises by the producers themselves, and as well extending into the community. Okay? Um, now, I don't have to tell you that this is not quite a, this is quite a, a long ways from what called itself social or communism in the 20th century, uh, what calls itself that today, um, because Marx makes it quite clear, well, let me just put it this way, I haven't, it's very curious to me, Marx does discuss in at least 10 different passages I found substantially what a post-capitalist society would consist of, but you know what, in none of the 10 does he mention the words of the state. And where he does talk about the state, like his writings in the Paris Commune, he always makes the point that the greatness of the Paris Commune was that it subsumed the state under the power of, of freely associated control of society. It minimized the role of the state. Instead of elevating the state over society as a path to revolutionary transformation, it elevated society over that of the state. It turned it upside down, okay? inverted the inversion. Because the state is also an inversion, inverted, alienated expression of human development. So, what am I getting at here? I'm trying to get to the end here. Um, there's a lot of components that we have to rethink in light of uh, what I've been saying here, such as the need for social ownership of the means of production, or democratic decision making by freely associated producers. We certainly need both. You couldn't get to a new society without having both social ownership of property and uh, freely associated uh, uh, control of cooperatives. Um, but I think it bears noting that we can't stop at social ownership as the definition of what socialism is because the form of property ownership is a, juridic, is a juridical relation. It's epiphenomenal. Production relations are the more fundamental relationship. and um, it's what underpins the property relations that's more fundamental than the specific property relation itself. So another way of putting it is to say that social ownership of the means of production is critical only insofar as it is part and parcel of eliminating alienated labor and the dominance of abstract forms of domination, most of all is the elimination of abstract universal labor time. Likewise, a democratic form of decision making is essential for any social society. Um, because how can you have uh, control of society by human beings themselves without them having democratic input into that? Uh, and yet, um, if you have control, what does control mean? I can set up a cooperative with a few friends of mine, and we control the process of producing what we're making, but if then when we have to sell that product, it turns out that it has a price tag on it that is going to be determined by how well it can compete with other products like that on the market, and other people can produce the price much lower than me because they're exploiting their workers, and I'm not, well, then what happens? Then I have to conform to that price level, otherwise our cooperative is going to be pushed out of business. And so what you end up with a situation is <coughs> a workers' cooperative in a sea of capitalism could very often be um, uh, uh, a form of workers valorizing their own labor in a capitalist relationship, even when it's democratically controlled. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about these things. It's a, it's a much broader systemic change, I think, that he's suggesting than we often discuss. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, before concluding, I just want to say one other thing. I'm aware that these ideas of a new society that I'm drawing from Marx seem a bit abstract and certainly distant from the present moment when even trying to discuss an alternative to capitalism seems problematic, uh, it may appear that it may be better to focus on what transitional forms can get us to, such, to a post-capitalist society without, before we discuss the nature of that post-capitalist society itself, or at least some of the major concepts of it. But uh, there's a very good reason I haven't done so here. And the reason is very simple. I think we already know what the transitional form to create a social society is. That answer has already been given to us by history. But we don't know much about the specific content of the post-capitalist society itself. That has not had much discussion. And what do I mean when I say that proper transitional form of socialism has already been uh, uh, suggested to us by history? 
Well, if you look at the struggles of the last hundred years, it's made it abundantly clear, I think, that decentralized forms of non-statist organizations are best suited for making an exit from capitalism. That was true of the Soviets, spontaneous forms of democratic self-governance that emerged in 1905 and then again in 1917. That was even more true in Spain 1936, when the Spanish workers didn't focus, and peasants didn't focus on seizing state power first and then figuring out how to transform production relations. They did it in reverse. First, they sat down in the factories and the fields. They took over occupation of them. They uh, put that as the primary question through decentralized democratic forms of deliberation. Uh, these sorts of workers' councils or other forms of student councils, neighborhood committees, were central to the Hungarian Revolution, central to France 68, central to the feminist movement, <laughs> central to the Arab Spring, central to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Can I give a few more examples? Do I need to? Uh, doesn't it seem that every time masses of people move in a radical direction, they move away from hierarchical forms of organization, contrary to what the Leninists keep trying to tell us, and they posit these much more liberatory democratic forms? Well, Marx looked at that kind of form in the Paris Commune of 1871. He said, that is the political form for creating the new society. Now, if he said that 138 years ago or something, isn't that good enough for us now? When we have 140 years of experience, that makes that even more obvious. So um, the, the transitional form to socialism is, is actually not a mystery. What's harder to dig out is what's the positive content of socialism. And I've tried to say here that it has to begin with the, the rape from abstract universal labor time as this external determinant that dominates the producer. Uh, and what has to replace it is time is a space for human development. And if that is done on a fundamental level, it would seem to me, uh, as I think Marx is suggesting, that an alternate form of distribution rather uh, than the market would emerge from this, in which people are compensated not by of wage labor, prices, exchange values, abstract forms of expression. They rather are compensated by a much more concrete, sensuous, particularist uh, form of distribution. One hour of labor counts for one hour of labor. That is the actual amount of time you contribute to the community. You receive back from that community goods and services produced in that amount. Not average, not value, but amount of time. Clearly, of course, this is only what prevails in the initial phase of a socialist or communist society. Marx is fully aware that uh, in an initial phase of a socialist or communist society, you still have some sort of a quid pro quo going on. Huh? You get out what you put in. Okay? And that's necessary because we've been trained by this quid pro quo attitude by hundreds of years of capitalism. There has to be some sort of material motive in order to encourage people to, uh, to work, to contribute to society. But he does envision, and I think it was right to suggest this, that at a certain historical period, we don't know how long, uh, he never puts a timeline on it, and I think the last one in the world to suggest that, I, that we should do so today, this would no longer be necessary, and instead we would now break from the quid pro quo approach altogether and simply have from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. So let me just say, end with this one word on that from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. What is that really saying? Is that saying, oh, okay, so I'm going to get my needs satisfied by society based on my level of abilities. That can't be what it means. Because people have different abilities, right? Okay? And those have different levels of needs. So, what do you, so if it was a quid pro quo, you're setting up a new model of inequality, aren't you? From each according to their ability to each according to their need does not mean that, oh, I get my needs met to the extent that I, that I have X or Y ability. It simply means that I give to society and other people based on my abilities for the sake of giving, and I get from society what I need for the sake of receiving. Now, uh, Truly, that is a rather visionary conception, but I should remind you of one thing that Aristotle said uh, in his uh, Ethics uh, when he talks about friendship. He says, you know, most people really don't know what friendship is because if you are a friend with somebody so you can use them for something, he says, that's not your friendship. Even if you're a friend with somebody for the sake of getting pleasure out of them, 
you're really treating them like a tool or an instrument because if you don't get pleasure from them at a certain point, you'll stop having them as a friend, right? Yeah? So he says, that's not true friendship. What is true friendship? He says, true friendship is giving to the other for the sake of giving without expectation. You give to the other because you love the other without expectation of reward. And isn't that what a true friend is? You give to the person you want to give to them because you love them so much. And if they give you back, fine. But if they don't, well, you know, that, but that doesn't, it's, not, it's not like you uh, say, here's the birthday present. And, oh, by the way, look, how much are you going to give me for my birthday present next year before I give you the present? <laughs> you get into that, I don't think your relationships are going to last very long. Giving to the other for the sake of the of the love of the other without expectation of return is really another way of saying from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to practice this principle so soon. I would hope we can, the sooner the better. I'd like to start right away. Uh, but Marx is realistic enough to outline some conception of a post-capitalist society in different phases that we can hopefully get to that point without being so unrealistic as to think we get there out of the shock of the physical. So these are just some basic ideas that I elaborate more in my book, but I'm certainly looking forward to your questions and comments, uh, because I think I'm bound to learn a lot more about this from our discussion uh, than I would simply by, uh, you know, uh, not having me this trip. Wonderful uh, lecture. Now it's uh, time for any questions, uh, comments. Uh, Thank you for this inspiring uh, lecture, uh, speech. Uh, to be a devil's advocate, all the examples of this tradition, transitional <coughs> uh, models have failed were defeated or deteriorated by themselves and so on. And one of the answers to this was usually uh, that uh, uh, transition should happen, that's a question of time, at the same time in the whole global world. Otherwise, uh, this, uh, let's say, national or small models cannot survive. What do you think about this problem of transitional models? Mm -hmm. They have to be applied globally or not at all. Do you want to take like maybe two or three at a time? Okay. And then I can respond to a couple at a time so we get more discussion in. Okay. Good question. Others jump in? Is there anyone else? Or you can speak in Slovenia and you can help out. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I have a question from the uh, thought of uh, the alternative to capitalism uh, through a process of uh, the abolition of this abstract form of so <coughs> domination. So this would, of course, also mean the evolution of uh, abstract uh, labor as we know it in capitalism. Uh, I'm correct. So I'm just wondering, uh, would uh, labor in uh, post-capitalist uh, society uh, simply be only concrete labor. It was, all labors would just be uh, heterogeneous, uh, plural, and they wouldn't have any universal or abstract dimension, or would there be a place for another kind of equality of different labors, uh, but that would be mediated in a different way than they're mediated in uh, Capitalism, for example, I don't know, Isaac Ilyich Rubin uh, makes uh, like this conceptual distinction between the three different kinds of uh, abstract labor. So the first one is uh, labor is abstract uh, because it's uh, always you kind know, of physiological labor, and this kind of labor, of course, exists in every society. And then he uh, speaks about abstract universal labor. Uh, this is the labor that exists in capitalism, but he also speaks about socially equal labor that uh, would exist or that would exist in any basically society that uh, has some sort of division of work. And he says that it would also uh, exist in socialism or uh, communism or whatever we want to call it. So I'm just wondering: so 
if we come to an alternative uh, to capitalism, would there just be concrete heterogeneous uh, works or would there be a different kind of uh, equal or abstract labor? Uh, I have a question regarding, let's say, transitions. Uh, let's say uh, it assumes or absolutely requires for people to be well informed about the potential outcomes, let's say, or uh, the vision of the, let's say, post capitalistic world, and also that they make a, a decision based on, let's say, Perhaps we would make it by, but I would assume or I would uh, say that majority of people are maybe not prepared to go into that direction uh, themselves. If they, uh, even if they know what, what's expected, they prefer to stay within the boundaries of, let's say, the world they know already. And uh, so basically, what's, what's your uh, take on that? Yeah, I'll take them in reverse order, I think. Um, let's start with Europe, the most recent one. Uh, it's a very good point. Um, I don't presume that everybody, most people, I don't really know, uh, would be uh, engaged in this sort of discussion or would be prepared to, to think, you know, this a question of post-capital society. I do think it's the central task of those who are committed to the transformation of society. I don't think it's a question or a project that's going to be answered by one individual or one party or one group of people. I think it's going to take a prolonged debate, discussion over many years to flesh this out. Um, I think that if a new idea emerges from this discussion, a clear, viable alternative, even if it's, again, uh, many, many aspects of it left undetermined, this can have a mobilizing impact on people who may not be thinking about the future, but are thinking about the present. In other words, I used to believe that, well, people spontaneously get involved in politics, and then they get into broader issues and think about more long-range problems, and this is the trajectory, you see? And I think that's often still true. After all, nobody like you know pops out of the womb and says, "Hey, I want to abolish value production." <laughs> it is not the first reason. It's not, I'm sure not the reason you became politically active. Your first thought was, "Oh, to abolish social necessary labor time." You know, <laughs> it was my first. I didn't like racism. That's why I got involved in politics. Uh, there's a lot of different things we come from, but I think we also have to ask why there is so much reticence for many people to get involved in politics. I think it's because they don't feel they know what the alternative is. It's like, why should I get involved in a fight if I don't know what we're headed for, you see? So I also think that has an element here. So even if a, a relatively small number of people are able to generate a viable conception, it can have an inspiring impact on people who themselves have not been necessarily thinking about that project themselves. Which doesn't mean that it's an exclusionary project. I think it should be as open as possible. But yes, we have to be realistic. This doesn't seem a bread and butter issue right now. <laughs> uh, but for those who think it's an important project, let's hope we can make some progress. Best I can answer. On this question of labor, this is a very, very good question. I think that um, it may help to um, clarify terms a little bit. Um, Abstract labor is not the same as simple labor. Now, sometimes a little slippage in Marx on this. Uh, one place he uses one term, one place he uses another, and he goes back and forth in the terms, right? But what is simple labor? Simple labor is uh, labor in the generic sense that's transhistorically present. That is, he says in the chapter one of Capital and very often many other places, Critique of the Gothic Program, labor is the metal metabolic interaction. The metal metabolic interaction what forms a metabolic interaction between humanity and nature. <clears throat> and it's necessary to all forms of society in which human beings live. It's a very thin, general conception of labor. Very abstract, right? <clears throat> but that's not abstract labor. Abstract labor is particular to capitalism. Um, I'm reluctant to say that concrete labor is what operates in a post-capitalist society, however, because the dual character of labor both sides of the continent, so unity and difference, 
that both require each other. So you, it's not like when you engage in labor in a capitalist society, one minute you're doing abstract labor, the next minute you're exerting your concrete labor. Every instant of performing a singular act of labor, you're simultaneously doing two things at the same time. You're engaged in a specific skill or activity, but it also is undifferentiated insofar as it has a singular form to it, okay, which is expressed as abstract labor. So if you shatter that duality, that, that division between concrete and abstract labor, it's a very Hegelian conception because it's an identity that's fused together in a non-identity, you see? Or it's an identity of identity and non-identity. It's a very it's a unity of opposites. If you shatter that contradiction, then I don't think you would, it would be proper to call it concrete labor because it would be not labor as we currently know it. See? You might call it more specific, differentiated labor um, outside the value form. That might be a better way to put it. But do understand, um, Marx is always interested in the material conditions within the present that create the seeds for a new society. This is very, very important to retain. The fact that capitalism is driven by a logic of trying to reduce the amount of living labor relative to uh, capital at the point of production and elsewhere in society, um, to minimize the amount of labor relative to uh, the amount of labor time it takes to produce things, is a material condition for a new society because it means that once we get to socialism, we don't have to spend as much time engaging in necessary labor. It's shrunk to a, in a, to a minimum. It doesn't ever disappear completely, but it shrinks considerably, which allows us to do much else that's really not reducible to labor at all. I wouldn't really call it labor, concrete labor, anything. It's, it's various forms of creativity. See? Um, so labor is not the same as praxis. Human praxis is a much broader category than labor, and hopefully in the new society we're engaged in freely creative praxis. Some of it might involve labor, but far less of our time engaged in in it than today, and any time engaged in it would be freely associated, not alienated. Okay. That's my best I can say that. On the first question, yes, I agree with you that um, the, um, it can't happen on a small scale. You can't have socialism in one, in one province. You can't have socialism in, in, in one country, according to Marx. This was a great mistake of the Stalinist conception. Um, and in terms of spontaneous movements, yes, they come and they go. This is, and some of them succeed and some of them fail. I should mention that the Vanguard parties also have a very poor success rate. Uh, I'm only a, 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 a aware of one classical type of Lenin's Vanguard party that came to power. And that happened in conditions of extreme luck, Russia 1917. <laughs> uh, I mean, a few circumstances a little bit differently, Lenin wouldn't have been in power. Uh, retrospectively, you could look back and say, ah, he was such a genius of the art of insurrection. Uh, but he couldn't reproduce that art of insurrection when it came to the German Revolution, when it came to the revolutions in Eastern Europe, when it came to a couple of other places. So um, the Vanguard Party is also a history of, of prolonged failures. Um, but yes, in any kind of systemic change of capitalism, is going to have to be global. And it's a very difficult question. It's not, the revolu world revolution is not going to happen all in the same day. Yeah? So what happens in the interim? Well, many times societies are going to have to make reform measures. Socialists and radicals and communists are going to have to take part in, in trans social transformations in which the society is not yet at the level where it can enter a socialist or communist society. And yet they can still make an important contribution to reforming or improving conditions in that society. Where I have the problem is when people call that activity Oh, but it's still a social society where it's on the way to socialism. You see, if, if, if you can't, if you, the revolution breaks out in, you know, Chicago tomorrow, and it's, that's the only place it ever happens, and we do great things to reorganize social relations in Chicago, the last thing I want to do is say, hey, we're creating socialism in Chicago. I would say, hey, we're creating a more democratic form of governance, more participatory democracy, uh, better wages for workers, or what have you. But it's still within capitalism. The danger is when you make a virtue out of necessity, when you give the label socialism or communism to something that does not have a socialistic or communist content yet. It may have a form, but not a content yet. Because then the next generation comes along and thinks, oh, the limited advance that you made, that's as far as we can go. You see, that defines the horizon of possibility. So, look, I, I'm not saying that uh, 
you know, Venezuela or someplace like this. Uh, they can't make a revolution. They can't make socialism more by themselves. They can make an improvement in society. They made some improvements. But don't call it socialism. Call it what it is. It's a state capitalist society with socialistic features, perhaps. That's good enough. Let's just be honest about what we're doing. And this way we avoid a lot of confusion. more questions? Yeah, um, I would just uh, ask a question about uh, this, uh, what Marx also said, and uh, you also mentioned in this transitional phase, one hour is equal to one hour. Uh, first, I would like to ask you, um, and because one, at one point you said about uh, different types of labor, why shouldn't my one hour be equal to one hour of garbage collector or, or whomever in society. It, it, you know the capitalist argument, I know, so it's it's the right argument, but it says, okay, we have to give incentives. Mm -hmm. They cannot be equal because then uh, nobody would want to do the hard part or whatever. They would say it's hard part, we couldn't, uh, we wouldn't have the development. And also you wrote that from Marx's perspective, we don't start by only saying capitalism is bad and wrong in every possible sense, but we acknowledge uh, the progressive aspect. So, and they would say this progressive aspect that in the end makes everyone better is connected to the incentive mechanism, the motivation mechanism that makes it unequal, the, the labor unequal of someone doing the high tech work, whatever, and someone doing the uh, uh, something that is not education, that doesn't necessarily need education and so on. So this would be my question, if one hour, that would be the first part, uh, from the capitalist point of view, capitalist ideology point of view. Uh, if one hour is equal one hour, wouldn't that destroy the incentive mm -hmm. for someone to <coughs> educate himself, be mm -hmm. uh, more productive? Or, or, and in the end, what you said uh, about uh, this uh, dogmatic conception of liberty of value, where uh, the more you work, the more value you produce, uh, if one hour was one hour, then uh, people wouldn't care how much they produce. They would just spend as many hours as they want so that they can whatever they want to do. That would be, I would say, capitalist from this like abstract discussion, if we had it at any point, that, that is the thing that they would say, I would say, I, 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 I imagine. And then the other part would be um, uh, if, whether this kind of tra transitional state based on this one hour is equal one hour, um, who, uh, is how are we to uh, be able to uh, uh, how are we to be certain if this uh, model is really a transition to the model of uh, 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 production according to the need or production according to the possibility and this distribution according to the need because um, uh, this would still link. The, the 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 labor the work and the use value the the individual gets in this society and uh, if the transition is towards a society where this link is broke where we say it doesn't uh, it isn't related whether how much you really work or how much you are able to produce uh, uh, so that, that you can get the use value that you need if this is uh, the, the, this ideal uh, second stage uh, communism. How, uh, is the, how is this the transitional state uh, that transitions towards this kind of uh, ideal state, maybe? Uh, I have a related question uh, regarding efficiency. I agree with uh, Alexander that uh, one of the first things that any Marxists have to say about capitalism is that it's immense uh, progressive character, if the only one, one of the rare was that it brought about great ecological uh, revolution, uh, productivity increase and so on. I mean, we live completely different now than we, than, uh, we would for, uh, even a hundred years ago. Uh, so uh, what do we do about things such as, I don't know, I like science and spaceships and so on, and uh, I think that uh, we should have a technologically uh, immensely progressive developed society. Do we also say that um, we should just leave it to democratic deliberation amongst people, uh, whether we will continue this technological improvement uh, or not, uh, because there won't be any mechanism such as market competition that um, necessitates uh, constant technological uh, improvements. 
uh, and innovations. What would we do about that? Uh, could we leave some room for an impersonal mechanism that would be less aggressive and less pervasive than market competition, but that would still um, uh, enable us to uh, develop technologically every year, or say every five years, or so, something like that? Yeah, um, let's just imagine a situation. Let's say you have a cooperative, uh, even a, a, a system of workers' cooperatives in different locations. Um, in which uh, the enterprises or some sort of uh, eco-communities are organized according to the sort of cooperative uh, methodology, this communal production that he speaks of in the Grundrisse. Uh, it really, the answer to both questions uh, is very centrally located on this issue of time again. But if you say that, okay, you're going to be compensated based on the actual amount of, actual amount of labor time that you contribute to the community, okay? Now, um, you say, well, okay, well, I'm going to put in uh, six hours today to do this whatever, and I get compensated for this amount. But of course, this might be like, maybe my six hours, I'm going to be very lazy, I'm going to be doing things not very productive, etc., uh, in order to still get the six hours drawn from the common work, uh, from the common warehouse. But the two things to keep in mind here is, one, there is a democratic assembly in which people uh, can look at each other and say, wait a second, okay, we, we're not going to impose an abstract average, it doesn't come from outside of us, but we within this enterprise think that it makes sense to do this uh, deed in X amount of time. Now we may change our mind next week, we may say it's going to take, uh, it really should only take two hours, but then maybe seasonal conditions change, we say, you know what, actually it should take five. Uh, and maybe we decide that, you know, actually we can do it in two hours, but we can make the product better if we make it in three. You see, so you have a lot of room for variety, you see? There's nothing that stops the community from establishing some sort of determination of the amount of time that should be devoted to this given task, okay? Um, the, so it, it's not the, the determination of a time decision that is a problem, it's when it operates completely abstractly and independently of the cooperative and imposes its will on them from without, okay? Um, so there's going to be different cooperatives or probably different enterprises are going to be operating on a different standard to a certain degree. Because what one hour of labor counts for is not a universal average. You see, you see what I'm saying? Now, the second part of this is, it's the issue of technological innovation, is that surely it's possible for workers in an enterprise to say, listen, if you guys want to just slack off and... Uh, uh, do what can be done in four hours, but take eight hours to do it. Okay? That's their right, I guess. You can make that decision. There could be a vote about that, and the majority of people can say, yes, I'm going to do. Okay? Um, but the thing is this, is that um, time, I mean, labor is only one component of what a human existence is about. Praxis, human praxis is much richer dimension, concept and much more multifaceted than labor. There's play, there's enjoyment, there's uh, communal interaction, there's discussion, there's poetry, there's art, there's science, there's all kinds of things that get packed into human praxis that are not reducible to labor, okay? Um, I think what Marx is trying to get at is there should be a minimization of time engaged in material reproduction so that we can free up as much time as possible to satisfy these other emotional and cultural needs that individuals have, okay? So the short amount of time engaged in individual production, the better. Now there's no iron law that I know of in Marx or that I can think of now that would compel that to happen in the same way that the market compels that to happen, except the deliberative decision of people who say, listen, I could decide, hey, we all can vote today that we're gonna work eight hours a day, and you're going to have much less time to enjoy your life. But, you know, we can do this in two hours a day, and you can have the other six hours a day to be doing your music and doing your art and doing nice graffiti outside, whatever the hell it is that you want to do, okay? Uh, whatever turns you on, or do music, or do all the different pursuits uh, to, what, to, to manifest what Marx calls in another context a totality of manifestations of life. Huh? Now, of course, people can get together and vote. Not 
to enjoy their lives. <clears throat> and just to labor more than they have to. That's their right. I, if that's what they do, that's what they do. I don't think people will really make this decision in the long run. I think when we have the opportunity to democratically decide our economic relationships, given us, uh, the, the multiplicity of sensuous needs and desires that we have, which in capitalism, it all reduced to one thing, the sense of having. How much do I have? How much do I own? How much do I possess? But when you break from that mentality, and you break from a society that operates according to that logic, it seems sensible to me that people will have their senses and say, how can I recover enough time to deal with all these things? Now, if that's what happens, then that's actually a kind of built-in incentive for technological innovation, isn't it? Because if we, if we start to get more in touch with our multiplicity of human needs and desires, and there's only so much time, time is finite. You see, we only live so long, right? I mean, even in a new society, this is going to happen. Uh, we're still going to die. <laughs> uh, and mortality is, uh, we don't get around that. So uh, time is limited. So if you, we say, well, in this cooperative, we want to try to limit the amount of necessary labor so we have time for all these other things. Um, well, how do we do that? Well, maybe another technology would enable us to bring it down from four to two, or from two to one, or what have you. That, it seems to me, would be a viable, a viable model. But it's, it's, and different cooperatives can learn from each other without simply succumbing to an abstract market average. Okay? Now, there's going to have to obviously be some sort of central planning authorities that coordinates different things between the enterprise. That's a whole other level I haven't gotten into yet. Uh, but that's a, a more level of a modeling that's uh, more concrete that I'm trying to stick now to the conceptual basis. Yeah, I must say I disagree not so much with your answer but uh, with the question. Because I think that the question presupposes that in this new society labor will still be alienated. So I don't think there's... Yeah, exactly, exactly what you said. You know, the capitalist assumes that the situation we have now is trans-historical. Right. <clears throat> he doesn't see the fact that workers have to be forced to work, that there has to be an incentive mechanism like that, you know, that they are threatened with hunger mm -hmm. if they do not work and produce value and get paid for it because labor is alienated, because they don't produce to satisfy uh, social needs. <laughs> Even today we can see, I don't know, here in Slovenia we had uh, terrible problems with sleet um, this winter, you know, and you saw volunteer firemen going out there uh, working, I don't know, how, how many hour shift, uh, never, not sleeping for a couple of days, a lot of them getting injured, even dying, and it, I didn't see them, you know, slacking about and thinking, well, nobody's forcing me to do this. Uh, why should I bother? They were thinking, I can contribute you know, to society, I, I can fulfill social needs through this work, and this is, I think, how we should imagine the new world. This is a motivation. Work itself is not uh, a burden. It becomes a burden insofar as it is alienated. Yeah, thank you very much. I meant, because I realized I didn't really directly address this aspect of what you raised, and I, I agree with you very much, is that um, Work has just become this pejorative. So, of course, the capitalist is going to approach this by saying, well, you have to have some sort of external pressure, right, to produce efficiency or adequate work outcome, etc. But, you know, there's a lot of examples in currently existing societies, alienated as it is, right, where people devote themselves quite considerably to, their, to labor when they find it enjoyable and satisfying. Um, so, I, I had a, a friend, I was a friend of mine, for instance, who's teaching uh, the three classes. Uh, he, has, well, he has a very nice job. He loves what he does. He teaches Plato, and he doesn't do much else. He's not a political person, not a political activist, but he just loves Plato. And he's a very smart guy, and he's teaching three classes a semester. And they, they, the administration came to him and said, you know, you, uh, Frank, you've been, uh, you're now up at a much higher status. You've been full professor. You know, you don't have to do two and three, you know, five classes a year. You can do two and two. It would drop you down one. And he wouldn't do it. He said, no, I'm, you're going to take away one of my seminars? For me, this is how I manifest my life by teaching this. You see, because that's a non-alienated type of labor for him. Understand, he's not imaginable. Oh. He's getting paid two thousand dollars a course. Uh, so even within the existing society, we have evidence of where uh, the kind of thing you're talking about. So how much broader would it be in a, in a in a society in which the whole alienated structure of labor would be shattered?
I have a question sort of connected to uh, what was said. You were talking about, let's say, doing uh, two hours worth of work in like eight hours. Uh, and my personal view is, let's say, that the amount of work hours that uh, people themselves are going to need to do is dropping, is mm -hmm. going down. With the technological uh, and all the advancements being made. So uh, all of this, uh, let's say from Mark's uh, perspective, all is based on work done by people. Mm -hmm. How is, like, uh, if there isn't enough work for, let's say, all the people, mm -hmm. how does the theory work then? And uh, in connection to, let's say, work hours, uh, I come from a different background, so uh, let's say there's a, a certain minimal requirement for a person to do, let's say, X hours of work a month, just to be able to stay with uh, the, to, to keep the quality of work proper. So how, how low can we go in that aspect, say? Uh, or some types of work there where you can't exactly extend it. Something, uh, say, if you're cooking, you can't exactly <laughs> cook an, an hour of a meal in like six hours. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I have also a second question, so I don't have to uh, ask again. In regards to natural resources, how do they connect, let's say, now they are valued in, uh, let's say, the in money or whatever. So how there are the natural resources in this new type of society valued or distributed or is it like globally, uh, more locally or uh, I, I think this is still a party romantic picture what Sasha said. Uh, about alienated labor disappearing as soon as we enter into a post-capitalist uh, society. Uh, I agree that alienation would uh, start disappearing with the abolition of market competition, at least slowly and in the majority of workplaces, but I can't imagine, even in a socialist, uh, higher socialist society, uh, how uh, jobs like cleaning the toilets, uh, cleaning the streets, removing garbage from our uh, homes and so on, things that will have to be done. Uh, people will have to do these things at least, um, at, le uh, at least until we develop technology to, and robots to do it uh, for us. How this type uh, of work can be non-alienated uh, or non-alienating? Uh, How can we say that a garbage collector, which you mentioned, uh, is expressing his life's essence or human essence in his work? Uh, uh, the same way as a poet or a writer or a philosophy professor does when he um, teaches uh, his seminars and so on. I think that a lot, uh, even hundreds of years uh, into the socialist uh, society, uh, a lot of people, millions, even maybe hundreds of millions of people will have to remove trash from our doors and uh, clean the streets and so on, and scrub toilets in restaurants, and I can't see how this uh, work would be a non-alienated or non-alienating uh, just because it's not subject to market competition. Well, yeah. uh, I just wanted to add a quick comment on the space exploration issue that you mentioned, uh, but that I think it's not mentioned enough. I, th I think space exploration programs were one of the um, most important things about historically existing or really existing uh, socialism. And I disagree, I think capitalism rather has a quite dismal record regarding uh, space exploration. It developed, it sent uh, a human to the moon, uh, to the moon uh, because it was in that historical situation in competition with the Soviet Union. I, I'm really, uh, I don't really believe uh, that, they would, that the United States would put so much money and effort um, uh, into this project. If there wasn't symbolic and political prestige uh, in the competition with the Soviet Union involved, and after the Soviet Union fall back in <coughs> this space race, uh, the US also um, uh, slowed down drastically, and in the last uh, half a century, they managed to send some probes uh, to, uh, to some planets. So 
uh, I think um, I will turn the perspective around. So not uh, maybe historically <coughs> capitalism enabled this huge technical uh, leap for humanity that allowed um, that allowed space exploration a couple of centuries uh, later. But imagine how much space exploration we could do if there were no profit motive or uh, other structural constraints on, su on such activity. If we could just, if humanity could just do space exploration for its own sake, so it wouldn't be constrained by uh, private gain if it's done by, uh, let's say, a cartel of private companies, or by the general state of accumulation if it's financed by by taxpayers and has to compete. Uh, among various other uh, state budget uh, uh, projects, I think I think it would develop much more readily, at least in principle. Um, yeah, on, on your point, um, <coughs> uh, my argument is not that the abolition of market relationship would lead to the abolition of alienated labor. Um, my argument, because historical experience shows you can eliminate a market, a free market economy without eliminating alienated labor. And this is the genius of Marx's point when he says in 1844, in the course of his critique of what he called crude communism, he says, it's not that uh, private property causes alienated labor, but alienated labor causes private property. Very puzzling passage, because it can't be historically accurate, because private property definitely precedes alienated labor historically. But in terms of logical priority, alienated labor comes first. So alienated labor is the condition for the possibility of a generalized market economy, or abstract labor, dual character labor, etc. They're not quite the same things. I'm being a little slippage here, but for the sake of a quick answer. Um, but the point is, is that I don't certainly think that getting rid of market economy is ipso facto automatically any assurance of getting rid of alienated labor. Uh, that's why I really put the market as secondary. I'm not a market socialist. Um, because I think that market socialists tend to import into the new society capitalistic categories like exchange value and value, which I think don't belong there. But at the same time, I'm not critical of them because I think that the market is a central problem. The market is an empty phenomenon, it's a secondary problem. An important problem, but a secondary problem. More importantly, though, in your question about alienated labor, uh, well, don't some forms exist? Well, I mean, think about this. I don't know how you feel when you clean your house. I mean, or you wash your dishes, or this kind of thing. Do you feel alienated doing this? No, I mean, I, women does that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we have broken that gender barrier by now, but I know that that's not happened. Well, I'm not talking about with you, I'm just saying generally in society. So I mean, it, it is an alienating uh, household labor because of the whole gender. By the way, there's a very good book out that's been published by Heather Brown, Marks on Gender and the Family, that goes into his own work on some of this. Kind of, Compliments minus. Uh, no, I mean, quite seriously, I, I have to admit, I don't particularly like cleaning my house, uh, but I do it because if I don't get the shit kicked out of me by who I would, but <laughs> aside from a few other things, but it's not really, it may be less than pleasant, but I wouldn't call it alienating, right? Um, it's not quite the same. Now, you, the, there's going to be all kinds of unpleasant activities we're going to have to do in a post-capitalist society. Let me correct myself. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, I, I was wrong. I didn't mean to say that it was alienating, but that uh, somebody in a socialist society could work for 40 years as a garbage collector. Yeah. I wouldn't. Uh, I couldn't say that he lives a rich, uh, fulfilling life. That's right. Uh, at least when he's working, when yeah. he's collecting other people's garbage. Yeah. Um, uh, as compared to a philosophy professor yeah. that loves his students. And, and here there is no distinct, this is a kind of a trans-historical category. Garbage is called uh, garbage, garbage men in feudalism, capitalism, or socialism uh, uh, don't live fulfilling lives, uh, regardless of the social form in which they live. Well, <laughs> yes, but they also take very different forms depending on the nature of the society. So one thing we have to think about is to reformulate what we understand as garbage. I mean, I just came with a group of, a group of artists this morning who are doing some very interesting things with garbage. Uh, they're not throwing it out, they're using it for all kinds of artwork. Anyway, besides that, uh, to minimize the amount of waste, to minimize the amount of garbage, so fewer people have to be engaged in this type of work, okay? Secondly, to break up the social division of labor so somebody doesn't have to do one job and one type of work for 40 years, if there's some kind of unpleasant tasks, that it's more circulated through the community. Uh, in a post-capitalist society, we're going to have to do a lot of unpleasant work in cleaning up the mess created by capitalism in terms of the environment. 
right? I mean, there's gonna be an awful lot of things we're gonna to have to clean up, literally, right? Uh, that's uh, poison the earth and poison the waters and everything else. Uh, some of that might be uh, enriching, but some of it's uh, gonna be a pain in the ass. Uh, so we're gonna to have to figure out how to organize that so there is not a group of people who are segmented into that. That would be a problem, you see? And this gets us to, to a very important question you raised about, about nature, is that, uh, I'm giving a paper on this in China in a few weeks on, on Marx's, on the, on the question of ecology, Marx and ecology. Um, there's intimations of this in Marx, not enough, unfortunately, because he lived in an era where the development of the forces of production seemed to him the primary, major condition for the creation of a social society. Uh, and I think today we're facing that problem very much of the destructive nature environmentally of these same forces of production. So we're going to have to take some of them down, not just take some of them up build them up. But as soon as nature is, is placed within a... Nature is a finite magnitude. The value of production is an infinite magnitude. So as soon as you begin to think in terms of nature as how valuable is it in a... We're not using the word valuable like I value your smile, I value your friendship, but valuable in a quantitative monetary relationship, right? When we start thinking about nature this way, okay, uh, there is no barrier to the endless, continuous exploitation of nature. Because nature is a finite magnitude, the acquisition and the augmentation of value is an infinite magnitude. Capitalism is driven by this infinite magnitude, but it's operating in a world of finite limits, but it ignores these finite limits. So, uh, there's already a suggestion in the 1844 manuscripts where Marx uh, says that um, we have to recognize the finite limits in which human beings operate because we are extensions of nature. We don't create nature ab novo. He says this almost in so many words. We don't create nature. We can transform our social nature because we create our social nature. He gets this idea from Vico later on. Okay? We can only change that which we create. But we don't create nature, so we can't completely transform nature. We can modify it, but we can't completely transform it. You see? Um, so, it's going to have to be a very different relationship to nature, as one of respect that is missing now. Um, and it's sort of a, kind of a humbling quality that we're going to have to have in relationship to this. And we need to get this pretty soon, even before we get to any close capital society, otherwise we may not be around for a while, uh, for very soon. Uh, this is also, by the way, a very interesting comment on space exploration. I agree with everything you said, but I have to confess, I might be a little bit uh, unorthodox in this point of view. Um, more than from this point of view. Uh, I'm not a big fan of science fiction. A lot of science fiction I've read. I mean, I like, with all I want to say about the imagination. Why? Because some of it has fooled us into dreaming about the possibility of living in realms outside of our planet in a sustainable way. I just don't see that happening. I don't want to live on Pluto. You know, I don't want to go to Mars. I don't really want to walk around the space suit so the rest of life. We can't create an artificial atmosphere. We can't create just just think of what it's taken to create a little bit of soil. The worms, the nematodes, the bacteria, the, the organisms. The, it's incredibly complicated, just a piece of holding up a piece of dirt in your hand. And you think of how many centuries it took for that to be developed through natural organic processes, right? We can't create nature through this process. So we're going to have to make life, we're going to have to make do with the planet we've got. Now, I'm not against explore, exploring the other, you know, sending something out there. I don't really see the need for human space exploration because, uh, you know, you're going to die from radiation after three years if you're out there. And the, where are you going to get within three years? Uh, halfway to Mars? Um, I'm not against the exploration or everything, but I think we have to reconfigure the imagination back to an Earth-bound universe, as for an Earth, an Earth-centric universe, because I just don't think we're going to. Um, there's no other future for us than uh, this tiny little planet. This is what we're born on. This is the one we're going to die on. We better make it better and sooner. Uh, it's not going to be some beautiful garden of Eden out there that we're going to get to by sailing away in a spaceship at the speed of light for 8,000 years. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's reasonable. Um, I don't know. I didn't answer all the questions, probably. But I'll give you time to jump in. Any more questions? Or comments? I think this is completely ridiculous. Don't be shy about saying so. Unlike this question I asked before.
before about the work hours and uh, ah. the and uh, okay. So you were asking really about will there be enough work? Yes, and basically how to ensure the quality of work given the let's say low work hours probably. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, this is going to depend on circumstances, which is really uh, I'm not sure what things would look like by then. A lot of this is uh, uh, we're going to have to. It's hard to know in advance, but I would think a couple of things. One is that. Um, <coughs> In capitalism, quantity trumps quality. There's no question of that. I mean, I was just in, uh, you know, the Central Cathedral in Prague two days ago, which was built in, uh, well, the Baroque one, you know, was redone a little bit, the 1640s. We don't have that many of these in the States, you understand, as you guys have here to look at these wonderful churches and everything. We were just sitting there, I was with Michael Lowy, you know, from, from Paris, and we're just talking about the, uh, the artwork and the and this beautiful church and everything. And um, we asked each other, I, uh, Michael asked me, have you ever seen a building in the last 100 years built as beautiful as this? Or 200 years even? Well, artwork is, is, is superb. It's not the greatest church in the world, by the way, by any means. And no, but think of the level of productive forces in the 17th century when this church was built up under castle complex, right? And think of what uh, we have, the, the, what economic possibilities we have today that's hundreds, economies are hundreds and not thousands of times more powerful. And yet we cannot create anything approaching the beauty of what you saw in that period. Why is this? So, so quantity really trumps quality. I mean, the feudal laws may have been very vicious and, and horrible, but they had good taste, which is more than you can say about today's bourgeoisie. <laughs> okay? So, uh, <coughs> The, 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 the point that I'm getting at is a lot of things about this time element is going to be reconfigured in a way we may not quite appreciate right now. Yes, you want, there's advantages to bringing down the amount of time that you do working on something, but you go to Picasso and say, well, by the way, finish that painting faster so that you can do something else. You know, I mean, I don't think there are some people who just want to do something, the same thing over and over, right? And they want to do it slowly, they want to do it well. There was a, a wonderful, well, I don't know how it would find it so wonderful, but I forget who it was now, a very early modern artist. Um, he uh, had one of his very early, early in the 19th century, 1840s. Was it Whittier? Uh, he painted a painting and so it was exhibited at an art gallery, and a famous French classical painter came and looked at it and said, This is horrible. This is, you know, he didn't like modern art. He said, This is, he said to him, in his gallery, he said, This is terrible. I mean, how long did it take you to paint this painting? He said, It took me about two days. He says, two days? Well, that's why it's such a terrible painting. You know, uh, what, how long do you think it took Michelangelo to, to paint his things, or Leonardo, or how long it takes me to paint my things? He says, well, it took me two days to paint it, but it took me 40 years to think about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of creative energy and training to be able to produce that, which he didn't appreciate. So there's going to be all sorts of different time determinations here, you see? So I think there's not going to be a shortage of things to do. I, I'm not worried about that. Um, what I'm worry about is in this society, the way we're organized today, um, where we're, we're work, we can reproduce our necessities with a much lower quantity of labor time devoted to material reproduction that's currently existing. But we're going to have to cut down on consumption levels. There's certain things we don't need to consume, okay, and as much of, uh, and we're going to have to do that given the environmental crisis in any way. So let's start getting used to it, you see? So some things are going to be cut down, some things are going to be expanded, I would imagine. I don't know which ones. I'm not, I really don't have a way to know that in advance, but I just have a feeling that there's going to be... Capitalism <coughs> operates according to a, 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 single, you know, a singular driving principle. Uh, the new society will not, and therefore this is one, uh, one thing I can hopefully leave you with. Marx provides us with a systematic it sound like the opposite now of what I was saying for this entire evening. Because now I'm going to talk about, just say a word about Marx's critique of capital, not what he said about the alternative. There's, if you can say one thing that Marx did achieve is a systematic critique of capital. Unfinished, it's not a finished pro a critique, it's open-ended, and he lived to do all of it, but he produced a systematic critique of capital. But you could only do a systematic critique of a system if the system itself presents itself as a system. The society has to present itself in systematic form in order for you to critique 
it systematically. Capitalism presents itself as a system because it operates, it's driven and governed by a singular principle, capital. But a post-capitalist society will not be driven by a single principle because it will not be dominated by capital, and therefore there's no singular principle, there's no systemic discussion of it possible. So I, I don't think I can provide, or anybody can provide, as far as I'm concerned, a systemic, systematic, a, a system of what post-capitalism is like. I don't think we can go that far because there would be no systematic knowledge if the society in question does not operate and does not present itself to us in the form of a system. Pre capitalist societies do not present themselves to its members in the form of a system. And that's why economics doesn't emerge as a separate discipline until the rise of capitalism. See? Because you can't have a study of society with, unless society itself takes the form of a system. See? So it's, a lot's going to be much more open ended. In terms of it. Yes, you can know basic principles, the basic concepts, and build up from there, but uh, it's going to be much more particularistic than universal. Okay, last round of questions. Yeah, let's talk. The uh, centric view is a bit narrow. Um, I, don't think, I don't think the earth will last forever. What's that? You said about what you think about the earth, just the earth centric, not space exploration. So I just see as much as we should cultivate the field for our users, mm -hmm. we'll have to look to cultivate planetary resources as well, because this one has to forever. And even in your, your asteroid bit here, asteroid destroyed the planet, or, or sun will expand to that side billions of years. Oh, yeah. I like, yeah. see we should think as far as we can. Like on a universal like, level, not just the Earth. I see what you're saying. Well, um, it, we're, uh, uh, everything that comes into existence is <coughs> out of existence. Uh, so I, I don't think that we can overcome uh, the, our finitude. We can make our finitude as good as possible. Okay? But there will be a point where it will end. It will be so, but we won't live to see that. That will be so many hundreds of millions of years. Even before, by the way, the, uh, you know, the, the, earth, the sun expands to burn up the sun. The, the earth, well, long before that, life will come to an end on earth to other you know, physicalist processes, uh, probably what they say, two, three hundred million years max, okay? Uh, if we have two hundred million year, more years, uh, damn, that's good. Uh, I'm worried that we're going to we're gonna have two hundred. Uh, if we reach a tipping point of global warming and everything else, I don't know how sustainable life is going to be on this planet. We may be headed for a sixth extinction. Within even our lifetimes, it's not inconceivable. It's very scary. So, um, yeah, I just don't think that uh, we need to think about existing forever, because nothing exists forever. Well, I think we should try. Well, we can find this. I, I, yeah. Well, what's the question that you want to ask about the Kyrgyzstan election? I don't know. Well, maybe... She will ask the same question. Maybe much. Hvala. u alternativnom društvu, da je užasno važno zapravo pomenuti ono što se redko kad pomenuti da je reproduktivni rad, koji je u kapitalizmu potpunosti naturalizovan i gurnut, dakle, iz sve direct wage labor. I apsolutno se, dakle, ne smatra radom kao što smo bilo koji drugi odnici aktivnosti koji nisu wage labor, koji ne smatraju legitimnim radom. I da možete se desiti da koliko govorimo u svojom razliku rada o prelazu tranzicije s kapitalizmom u to drugo društvo, koliko se sključivo fokusiramo na wage labor, ono što možete se desiti jeste da u tom nekom sledećem društvu opet žele rade da je reproduktivni rad, samo što se ono tu definiše kao jedna od aktivnosti koja su njima s obzirom na njihovu prirodu date, kao što se to dešava i u kapitalizmu. Dakle, mislim da taj aspekt ovo moramo naznačiti, mislim da je konačno ono došli krajne vreme da su progresene znage marxizma dovoljno napredovali da možemo o tome da govorimo uvek i na svaku temu, a ne da sključivo 
feminizem stavljamo na neku drugu stranu i ostavljamo ga da je kao posljednju temu. Dakle, mislim da je ovdje baš veoma bitno to naglasiti. I da mislim nije potpuno, to društvo o kojima govorimo nije potpuno koliko ne uzmemo na ove aspektuacije. Pogotovo kad govorimo o teoriju Marača. When we talk about an alternative society or an alternative to capitalism, at least Marxist people tend to touch upon all other, all different kinds of labor. So we talk about alienated and extract labor and how labor looks like, would it be called labor, would it be concrete labor? But what is often neglected in all of these uh, labor discussions and labor post capitalism is the reproductive labor or the reproductive activity done, done in the domestic sphere, which are outside the wage relation and therefore not validated by capital and therefore are not also not abstract or alienated in, in this sense, but still involve some kind of uh, um, uh, social oppression or uh, domination but which is not economic, at least not basically or in the origin. So um, if, we, um, if, we are, if we do not take this aspect of, uh, uh, let's say, non-economic aspect of social domination seriously, um, we risk in our uh, political attempts to overcome capitalism to reproduce some, uh, let's say, uh, some forms of social domination which are not capitalist but are no less, let's say, oppressive or dangerous or unwelcome, um, and even if you abolish all kinds of abstract or alienated labor, we still have this type of activities yes. which are pushed into a domestic sphere, so um, it's high time that uh, Marxist discussion begin to take this into account as its integral part, not some peripheral uh, feminist issue that we add on later. Was this, your, was this what you said, or you, yes. you, you, know, you, you agree with it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope you agree with me. Yes, okay. Well, thank you very much. No, I agree 100% with that. This is why, um, uh, this was a big emphasis of the work, by the way, of Ryan Dunievskaya, um, who was write, writing on uh, these issues of reproductive labor and, and women's relationship to uh, issues of Marxism back in the 1940s, long before some of the more recent literature came out. And the tendency that I'm part of, the International Marxist Humanist Organization, is had a, a this is, an, this is just what we came out of having a, a, an extensive discussion for the last several months, weekly discussions, on exactly this issue of reproductive labor and its relationship to, non, to value producing labor, so-called productive labor. And I really recommend uh, this book by Heather Brown, uh, which is in the same, published in the same series as Haymarket called Marx and Gender and the Family, where she tackles this question very directly. But I'll say this much here, is that first of all, uh, I don't view uh, the uh, revolution against capitalism as the only revolution. Uh, 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 and I, I think the orthodox Marxist position that, Marxist, that Marxism is a theory of class struggle primarily, and that issues of gender and race are sort of secondary considerations, if they're considerations at all, is fundamentally misplaced. And my reading of my as a Marxist humanist, instead I think we need to take the approach of restating and recreating Marxism for today's realities as a philosophy of liberation that opposes, that addresses, opposes, and tries to envision alternatives to all forms of dehumanization of humanity by humanity, uh, in whatever particular sector or form we find that. And unless we do that, a revolution against capitalism will not truly free us from the value form of mediation. So it's not like we think about the gender issues next week and now we focus on this, but that they all have to be thought about in conjunction together and what enables us to do that is the maturity of our age where these issues are now placed on the table before us in a way that they were not present in Marxism. Marx does have more to say on gender than we realize perhaps, but still we're not going to get feminist theory out of Marx, you see? Um, and this is to be understood because he's writing in a very different historical time and he, he had a very specific project that he wanted to address. He, try, he does do some interesting uh, things on reproductive labor, but hardly adequate for what we need to do for our reality today. Um, so this is why my next book, for instance, is on Franz Fanon, 
and I got a very good question uh, from you today, <laughs> early in our discussion, about why are you going from Marx to Franz Fanon, uh, critical race theory, because I think race, racism, is fundamentally has to be tackled and undermined. Um, it's not going to disappear just naturally. Any more than sexism is going to disappear just naturally. Oh, we get rid of alienated labor and racism and sexism disappear. This is not quite how it works. You have to address the different components of alienation as part of a philosophy of liberation and not reduce one to the other and not uh, but deal with them in their relation, deal with them on their own terms. And we can do this in our day in a way that I think Marx could not. Precisely because there's been a feminist movement, precisely because there's been an anti-racist movement, etc. So any human relationship that takes a dehumanized form has to be integrated centrally into the struggle against the economic conditions of capitalist uh, exploitation. Because if we don't do that, uh, we end up with a situation where, okay, we uh, address one half of the problem and the other half of the problem is left unaddressed and we turn around and we find ourselves reverting back into uh, the very thing that we're opposed to. Um, in my book, therefore, I mention, uh, just as an aside, that in what Marx is talking about in the lower phase of socialism or communism, <coughs> one hour of labor is worth one hour of labor. That means one hour of child rearing is worth just as much as one hour of teaching a Galilean philosophy. One hour of labor is worth one hour of labor. Now, this society doesn't value domestic labor as true labor, you see? But this isn't just because it doesn't produce surplus value. But to, 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 to uh, treat that as less valuable is to think capitalistically, because you're, th you're thinking in capitalistic categories. So in, in this notion of one hour of labor is equal to one hour of labor, think about that in terms of child rearing. Think about that in terms of domestic labor. Think about that in terms of <coughs> Uh, 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 childhood education. So just, just not to go on too long, but what is the least value, one of the least valued jobs, I don't know about here, but at least in the United States and Canada and Britain, one of the least paid, lowest paid jobs is pre-kindergarten uh, um, uh, child care. Pre, you know, 1 to 12 child care. But what job is more important for the future development of an individual than somebody's teacher within, you know, or, or whatever, when they're two, three, four years old. You see, it's incredibly important labor. But it's devalued because it doesn't create any surplus value. But in the kind of discussion I've been having today, this is not going to be viewed this, this way. We're not going to be no, I just wanted to, uh, you, you, you should emphasize that. Did you okay. mention the lecture and that was I right. had a comment. Uh, I right. that and this was an oversight I really should have, because every time I, generally I do, but this is, um, and the race issue, no less important, because if we look at what's the attack on the immigrant workers and the race situation in the United States, it's getting worse rather than better, and there has to be a different way of conceiving interracial relationships than what we have. But I agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.